Book Two, Chapters Seven through Nine of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One, by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book Two, Chapters Seven through Nine. Chapter Seven the removal of Joseph's father with all his family, to him on account of the famine. As soon as Jacob came to know, by his son's returning home, in what state Joseph was, that he not only escaped death, for which yet he lived all along in mourning, but that he lived in splendor and happiness, and ruled over Egypt jointly with the king, and had entrusted to his care almost all his affairs, he did not think anything he was told to be incredible, considering the greatness of the works of God and his kindness to him, although that kindness had, for some late times, been intermitted. So he immediately and zealously set out upon his journey to him. When he came to the well of the oath, Beersheba, he offered sacrifice to God, and being afraid that the happiness there was in Egypt might tempt his posterity to fall in love with it and settle in it, and no more think of removing into the land of Canaan and possessing it as God had promised them, as also being afraid, lest if this descent into Egypt were made without the will of God, his family might be destroyed there, out of fear withal, lest he should depart this life before he came to the sight of Joseph, he fell asleep, revolving these doubts in his mind. But God stood by him and called him twice by his name, and when he asked who he was, God said, No, sure, it is not just that thou, Jacob, shouldst be unacquainted with that God who has been ever a protector and a helper to thy forefathers, and after them to thyself. For when thy father would have deprived thee of the dominion, I gave it thee. And by my kindness it was that, when thou wast sent into Mesopotamia all alone, thou obtainedest good wives, and returnedest with many children and much wealth. Thy whole family also has been preserved by my providence, and it is I who conducted Joseph, thy son, whom thou gavest up for lost, to the enjoyment of great prosperity. I also made him lord of Egypt, so that he differs but little from a king. Accordingly I come now as a guide to thee in this journey, and foretell to thee, that thou shalt die in the arms of Joseph, and I inform thee that thy posterity shall be many ages in authority and glory, and that I will settle them in the land which I have promised them. Jacob, encouraged by this dream, went on more cheerfully for Egypt with his sons and all belonging to them. Now they were in all seventy. I once indeed thought it best not to set down the names of this family, especially because of their difficult pronunciation by the Greeks. But, upon the whole, I think it necessary to mention those names, that I may disprove such as believe that we came not originally from Mesopotamia, but are Egyptians. Now Jacob had twelve sons. Of these Joseph was come thither before. We will therefore set down the names of Joseph's children and grandchildren. Reuben had four sons, Enoch, Falu, Aseron, Charmi. Simeon had six, Jamwell, Jamin, Avod, Jachin, Soar, Saul. Levi had three sons, Gersom, Kaath, Merari. Judas had three sons, Sala, Phares, Zerah, and by Phares two grandchildren, Esram and Amar. Issachar had four sons, Thola, Phua, Jasob, Samaron. Zabulon had with him three sons, Sarad, Helon, Jalel. So far is the posterity of Leah, with whom went her daughter Dinah. These are thirty-three. Rachel had two sons, the one of whom Joseph had two sons also, Manassas and Ephraim. The other, Benjamin, had ten sons, Bolau, Bacar, Asabel, Geras, Naaman, Jess, Ros, Momphis, Ophis, Herad. These fourteen added to the thirty-three before enumerated amount to the number forty-seven. And this was the legitimate posterity of Jacob. He had besides by Bilhah, the handmaid of Rachel, Dan and Naphtali. 
which last had four sons that followed him, Jesel, Guni, Isari, and Selim. Dan had an only begotten son, Usi. If these be added to those before mentioned, they complete the number fifty-four. Gad and Aser were the sons of Zilpha, who was the handmaid of Leah. These had with them Gad seven, Saphaniah, Augus, Sunus, Azabon, Aaron, Erocht, Ariel. Aser had a daughter, Sarah, and six male children, whose names were Jomne, Isus, Isawi, Baris, Abar, and Melchiel. If we add these, which are sixteen, to the fifty-four, the forementioned number seventy is completed, Jacob not being himself included in that number. When Joseph understood that his father was coming, for Judas his brother was come before him, and informed him of his approach, he went out to meet him, and they met together at Heropolis. But Jacob almost fainted away at this unexpected and great joy. However, Joseph revived him, being yet not himself able to contain from being affected in the same manner at the pleasure he now had. Yet he was not wholly overcome with his passion as his father was. After this he desired Jacob to travel on slowly, but he himself took five of his brethren with him, and made haste to the king, to tell him that Jacob and his family were come, which was a joyful hearing to him. He also bid Jacob tell him what sort of life his brethren loved to lead, that he might give them leave to follow the same, who told him they were good shepherds, and had been used to follow no other employment but this alone whereby he provided for them, that they should not be separated, but live in the same place, and take care of their father, as also hereby he provided, that they might be acceptable to the Egyptians, by doing nothing that would be common to them with the Egyptians, for the Egyptians were prohibited to meddle with feeding of sheep. When Jacob was come to the king, and saluted him, and wished all prosperity to his government, Pharaoh asked him how old he now was, upon whose answer that he was a hundred and thirty years old, he admired Jacob on account of the length of his life. And when he had added, that still he had not lived so long as his forefathers, he gave him leave to live with his children in Heliopolis, for in that city the king's shepherds had their pasturage. However, the famine increased among the Egyptians, and this heavy judgment grew more oppressive to them, because neither did the river overflow the ground, for it did not rise to its former height, nor did God send rain upon it, nor did they indeed make the least provision for themselves, so ignorant were they what was to be done. But Joseph sold them corn for their money. But when their money failed them, they bought corn with their cattle and their slaves. And if any of them had a small piece of land, they gave up that to purchase them food, by which means the king became the owner of all their substance and they were removed, some to one place, and some to another, that so the possession of their country might be firmly assured to the king, excepting the lands of the priests, for their country continued still in their own possession. And indeed this sore famine made their minds, as well as their bodies, slaves, and at length compelled them to procure a sufficiency of food by such dishonorable means. But when this misery ceased, and the river overflowed the ground, and the ground brought forth its fruits plentifully, Joseph came to every city, and gathered the people thereto belonging together, and gave them back entirely the land which, by their own consent, the king might have possessed alone, and alone enjoyed the fruits of it. He also exhorted them to look on it as every one's own possession, and to fall to their husbandry with cheerfulness, and to pay as a tribute to the king the fifth part of the fruits for the land which the king, when it was his own, restored to them. These men rejoiced upon their becoming unexpectedly owners of their lands, and diligently observed what was enjoined them, and by this means Joseph procured to himself a greater authority among the Egyptians, and greater love to the king from them. Now this law, that they should pay the fifth part of their fruits as tribute, continued until their later kings. Chapter 8 Of the Death of Jacob and Joseph now when Jacob had lived seventeen years in Egypt, he fell into a disease, and died in the presence of his sons, but not till he made his prayers for their enjoying prosperity, and till he had foretold them prophetically 
how every one of them was to dwell in the land of Canaan. But this happened many years afterward. He also enlarged upon the praises of Joseph, how he had not remembered the evil doings of his brethren to their disadvantage, nay, on the contrary, was kind to them, bestowing upon them so many benefits, as seldom are bestowed on men's own benefactors. He then commanded his own sons, that they should admit Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manassas, into their number, and divide the land of Canaan in common with them, concerning whom we shall treat hereafter. However, he made it his request that he might be buried at Hebron. So he died, when he had lived full a hundred and fifty years, three only abated, having not been behind any of his ancestors in piety towards God, and having such a recompense for it, as it was fit those should have who were so good as these were. But Joseph, by the king's permission, carried his father's dead body to Hebron, and there buried it, at a great expense. Now his brethren were at first unwilling to turn back with him, because they were afraid lest, now their father was dead, he should punish them for their secret practices against him, since he was now gone, for whose sake he had been so gracious to them. But he persuaded them to fear no harm, and to entertain no suspicions of him. So he brought them along with him, and gave them great possessions, and never left off his particular concern for them. Joseph also died when he had lived a hundred and ten years, having been a man of admirable virtue, and conducting all his affairs by the rules of reason, and used his authority with moderation, which was the cause of his so great felicity among the Egyptians, even when he came from another country, and that in such ill circumstances also as we have already described. At length his brethren died after they had lived happily in Egypt. Now the posterity and sons of these men, after some time, carried their bodies and buried them at Hebron. But as to the bones of Joseph, they carried them into the land of Canaan afterward, when the Hebrews went out of Egypt, for so had Joseph made them promise him upon oath. But what became of every one of these men, and by what toils they got the possession of the land of Canaan, shall be shown hereafter when I have first explained upon what account it was that they left Egypt. Chapter 9. Concerning the Afflictions that Befell the Hebrews in Egypt During Four Hundred Years Now it happened that the Egyptians grew delicate and lazy, as to painstaking, and gave themselves up to other pleasures, and in particular to the love of gain. They also became very ill-affected towards the Hebrews, as touched with envy at their prosperity for when they saw how the nation of the Israelites flourished, and were become eminent already in plenty of wealth, which they had acquired by their virtue and natural love of labor, they thought their increase was to their own detriment, and, having, in length of time, forgotten the benefits they had received from Joseph, particularly the crown being now come into another family, they became very abusive to the Israelites, and contrived many ways of afflicting them, for they enjoined them to cut a great number of channels for the river, and to build walls for their cities and ramparts, that they might restrain the river, and hinder its waters from stagnating, upon its running over its own banks. They set them also to build pyramids, and by all this wore them out, and forced them to learn all sorts of mechanical arts, and to accustom themselves to hard labor. And four hundred years did they spend under these afflictions, for they strove one against the other which should get the mastery, the Egyptians desiring to destroy the Israelites by these labors, and the Israelites desiring to hold out to the end under them. While the affairs of the Hebrews were in this condition, there was this occasion offered itself to the Egyptians, which made them more solicitous for the extinction of our nation. One of those sacred scribes, who are very sagacious in foretelling future events truly, told the king that about this time there would a child be born to the Israelites, who, if he were reared, would bring the Egyptian dominion low, and would raise the Israelites, that he would excel all men in virtue, and obtain a glory that would be remembered through all ages. Which thing was so feared by the king, that, according to this man's opinion, he commanded that they should cast every male child which was born to the Israelites into the river, and destroy it 
that besides this, the Egyptian midwives should watch the labors of the Hebrew women, and observe what is born, for those were the women who were enjoined to do the office of midwives to them, and by reason of their relation to the king, would not transgress his commands. He enjoined also that if any parents should disobey him, and venture to save their male children alive, they and their families should be destroyed. This was a severe affliction indeed to those that suffered it, not only as they were deprived of their sons, and while they were the parents themselves, they were obliged to be subservient to the destruction of their own children, but as it was to be supposed to tend to the extirpation of their nation, while upon the destruction of their children, and their own gradual dissolution, the calamity would become very hard and inconsolable to them. And this was the ill state they were in. But no one can be too hard for the purpose of God, though he contrive ten thousand subtle devices for that end. For this child, whom the sacred scribe foretold, was brought up and concealed from the observers appointed by the king. And he that foretold him did not mistake in the consequences of his preservation, which were brought to pass after the manner following. A man whose name was Amram, one of the nobler sort of the Hebrews, was afraid for his whole nation, lest it should fail, by the want of young men to be brought up hereafter, and was very uneasy at it, his wife being then with child, and he knew not what to do. Hereupon he betook himself to prayer to God, and entreated him to have compassion on those men who had nowise transgressed the laws of his worship, and to afford them deliverance from the miseries they at that time endured, and to render abortive their enemies' hopes of the destruction of their nation. Accordingly God had mercy on him, and was moved by his supplication. He stood by him in his sleep, and exhorted him not to despair of his future favors. He said further that he did not forget their piety towards him, and would always reward them for it, as he had formerly granted his favor to their forefathers, and made them increase from a few to so great a multitude. He put him in mind that when Abraham was come alone out of Mesopotamia into Canaan, he had been made happy not only in other respects, but that when his wife was at first barren, she was afterwards by him enabled to conceive seed and bear him sons. That he left to Ismael and to his posterity the country of Arabia, as also to his sons by Keturah, Trogolditis, and to Isaac, Canaan. That by my assistance, said he, he did great exploits in war, which, unless you be yourselves impious, you must still remember. As for Jacob, he became well known to strangers also by the greatness of that prosperity in which he lived, and left to his sons, who came into Egypt with no more than seventy souls, while you are now become above six hundred thousand. Know, therefore, that I shall provide for you all in common what is for your good, and particularly for thyself what shall make thee famous. For that child, out of dread of whose nativity the Egyptians have doomed the Israelite children to destruction, shall be this child of thine, and shall be concealed from those who watch to destroy him. And when he is brought up in a surprising way, he shall deliver the Hebrew nation from the distress they are under from the Egyptians. His memory shall be famous while the world lasts, and this not only among the Hebrews, but foreigners also. All which shall be the effect of my favor to thee, and to thy posterity. He shall also have such a brother, that he shall himself obtain my priesthood, and his posterity shall have it after him to the end of the world. When the vision had informed him of these things, Amram awaked and told it to Jochebed, who was his wife. And now the fear increased upon them on account of the prediction in Amram's dream, for they were under concern not only for the child, but on account of the great happiness that was to come to him also. However, the mother's labor was such as afforded a confirmation to what was foretold by God, for it was not known to those that watched her by the easiness of her pains, and because the throes of her delivery did not fall upon her with violence. And now they nourished the child at home privately for three months, but after that time Amram, fearing he should be discovered, and, by falling under the king's displeasure, both he and his child should perish, and so he should make the promise of God of none effect, 
he determined rather to trust the safety and care of the child to God than to depend on his own concealment of him, which he looked upon as a thing uncertain, and whereby both the child, so privately to be nourished, and himself should be in imminent danger. But he believed that God would some way for certain procure the safety of the child, in order to secure the truth of his own predictions. When they had thus determined, they made an ark of bulrushes, after the manner of a cradle, and of a bigness sufficient for an infant to be laid in, without being too straitened. They then daubed it over with slime, which would naturally keep out the water from entering between the bulrushes, and put the infant into it, and setting it afloat upon the river, they left its preservation to God. So the river received the child, and carried him along. But Miriam, the child's sister, passed along upon the bank over against him, as her mother had bid her, to see whither the ark would be carried, where God demonstrated that human wisdom was nothing, but that the Supreme Being is able to do whatsoever he pleases, that those who, in order to their own security, condemn others to destruction, and use great endeavors about it, fail of their purpose, but that others are in a surprising manner preserved, and obtain a prosperous condition almost from the very midst of their calamities, those, I mean, whose dangers arise by the appointment of God. And, indeed, such a providence was exercised in the case of this child, as showed the power of God. Thermuthis was the king's daughter. She was now diverting herself by the banks of the river, and seeing a cradle borne along by the current, she sent some that could swim, and bid them bring the cradle to her. When those that were sent on this errand came to her with the cradle, and she saw the little child, she was greatly in love with it, on account of its largeness and beauty. For God had taken such great care in the formation of Moses, that he caused him to be thought worthy of bringing up, and providing for, by all those that had taken the most fatal resolutions, on account of the dread of his nativity, for the destruction of the rest of the Hebrew nation. Thermuthis bid them bring her a woman that might afford her breast to the child, yet would not the child admit of her breast, but turned away from it, and did the like to many other women. Now Miriam was by when this happened, not to appear to be there on purpose, but only as staying to see the child. And she said, It is in vain that thou, O queen, callest for these women for the nourishing of the child, who are in no way of kin to it. But still, if thou wilt order one of the Hebrew women to be brought, perhaps it may admit the breast of one of its own nation. Now since she seemed to speak well, Thermuthis bid her procure such a one, and to bring one of those Hebrew women that gave suck. So when she had such authority given her, she came back and brought the mother, who was known to nobody there. And now the child gladly admitted the breast, and seemed to stick close to it. And so it was that, at the queen's desire, the nursing of the child was entirely entrusted to the mother. Hereupon it was that Thermuthis imposed this name Moses upon him, from what had happened when he was put into the river. For the Egyptians call water by the name of Mo, and such as are saved out of it, by the name of Usus. So by putting these two words together, they imposed this name upon him, and he was, by the confession of all, according to God's prediction, as well for his greatness of mind as for his contempt of difficulties, the best of all the Hebrews, for Abraham was his ancestor of the seventh generation. For Moses was the son of Amram, who was the son of Caath, whose father Levi was the son of Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. Now Moses' understanding became superior to his age, nay, far beyond that standard. And when he was taught, he discovered greater quickness of apprehension than was usual at his age, and his actions at that time promised greater when he should come to the age of a man. God did also give him that tallness when he was but three years old, as was wonderful. And as for his beauty, there was nobody so unpolite as, when they saw Moses, they were not greatly surprised at the beauty of his countenance. Nay, it happened frequently that those that met him as he was carried along the road were obliged to turn again upon seeing the child, that they left what they were about and stood still a great while to look on him. For the beauty of the child was so remarkable and natural to him on many accounts 
that it detained the spectators, and made them stay longer to look upon him. Thermuthus therefore perceiving him to be so remarkable a child, adopted him for her son, having no child of her own. And when one time had carried Moses to her father, she showed him to him, and said she thought to make him her successor, if it should please God she should have no legitimate child of her own. And to him, I have brought up a child who is of a divine form and of a generous mind, and I have received him from the bounty of the river, in I thought proper to adopt him my son and the heir of thy kingdom. As she had said this, she put the infant into her father's hands. So he took him and hugged him to his breast, and on his daughter's account, in a pleasant way, put his diadem upon his head. But Moses threw it down to the ground, and, in a puerile mood, he wreathed it round and trod upon his feet, which seemed to bring along with evil presage concerning the kingdom of Egypt. But when the sacred scribe saw this, he was the person who foretold that his nativity would the dominion of that kingdom low, he made a violent attempt to kill him, and, crying out in a frightful manner, he said, This, O king, this child is he of whom God foretold, that if we kill him we shall be in no danger. He himself affords an attestation to the prediction of the same thing, by his trampling upon thy government, and treading upon thy diadem. Take him, therefore, out of the way, and deliver the Egyptians from the fear they are in about him, and deprive the Hebrews of the hope they have of being encouraged by him. But Thermuthus prevented him, and snatched the child away. And the king was not hasty to slay him, God himself, whose providence protected Moses, inclining the king to spare him. He was, therefore, educated with great care. So the Hebrews depended on him, and were of good hopes great things would be done by him but the Egyptians were suspicious of what would follow such his education. Yet because, if Moses had been slain, there was no one, either a kin or adopted, that had any oracle on his side for pretending to the crown of Egypt, and likely to be of greater advantage to them, they abstained from killing him. End of Book 2, Chapters 7-9